through the Roman Catholic Diocese of Lexington has a new bishop. Pope Francis appointed Father John Stowe of Ohio to the post. The spot was left vacant when the Pope appointed Bishop Ronald Gaynor as Bishop of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. WKYT's Hillary Thornton has more on the new bishop. Early this morning, around noontime in Rome, Pope Francis appointed Father John Stowe as the third bishop of the Roman Catholic Diocese of Lexington. The question was plain and simple. Do you accept Pope Francis's invitation to be the bishop of Lexington? An invitation bishop-elect Stowe says he is both humbled and filled with joy to accept. A decision that those at the announcement say they believe is not only positive for the Catholic Church, but the entire community. Very amazing to be here uh, and to know that Pope Francis has brought a friar to be the next Bishop of Lexington is a testament to what Pope Francis has been saying all along. We need to be a, ch a church for the poor, a church for the weekend, a church for the ill, the disadvantaged members of our community. Father Stowe says his priorities are different from most appointed bishops in worship and service. Fluent in Spanish, he says he is also looking forward to working with the Hispanic population. To have someone who is also bilingual is a testament to the need of the church to evangelize. Well, Francis speaks frequently about the need to be open to an encounter. An encounter with the other, an encounter with the poor, an encounter with Christ through them. The ordination and installation of Bishop-elect Stowe is planned for Tuesday, May 5th, and will likely take place at Christ the King. In Lexington, Hillary Thornton, WKYT. The Lexington Diocese is made up of 50 counties throughout central and eastern Kentucky. <laughs> Thought maybe they'd have blue smoke here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Father Dieberding. That was a very nice welcome, and thank you for what you've done for this diocese in the interim, not once, but twice. And I know that I don't have too many worries because of the way you've held things. And I know it speaks volumes that somebody who's been in retirement has been called forth by the consultors, by the priest, once again, to serve in that capacity. So thank you so much. And the bishops of the state of Kentucky, thank you, the Commonwealth of Kentucky, thank you so much for being here. Where to start? Funny thing happened on my way to Costa Rica a couple of weeks ago. I'm known in the Franciscan province for not carrying a cell phone and not having to use one when my mother plants one on me when I'm traveling. And so Brother Randy, who is one of the counselors of the province as well, and I were on our way to the airport in Cleveland and to fly to Costa Rica for a meeting with our friars there in Central America. Brother Randy gets this text on his phone that he notices when we pull into my parents' house. We're going to park the car there, and they're going to take us to the airport in Cleveland. So Brother Randy gets this text, and it says, uh, Brother Randy, I understand you are traveling with Father John Stowe. It is urgent that I speak to him before he leaves the country. And there were three initials at the bottom of that text that looked vaguely familiar, but not familiar enough. So then Brother Randy goes through and he listens to the voicemail. He says, he sounds Italian and the call is from Washington. And my heart sank. I suddenly recognized the initials from my days in the chancery and uh, gave Archbishop Vigano a call. And the question was plain and simple. Do you accept Pope Francis's invitation to be the Bishop of Lexington? My answer was, I love Pope Francis, and I would do whatever he asks. So, so here I am. Now, I had to sit down at my Italian mother's table after that and just stare at lasagna, but I didn't have much of an appetite. She knew something was up. Now they know. Well, obviously, this has been like nothing else that I've ever experienced, and this has been a Lent like none other for me. <laughs> I'm both filled with joy and humbled to be here before you this morning. So very grateful to Archbishop Kurtz, especially, who has warmly welcomed me to this region and has been so attentive to me in this period of shock. I'm also grateful, as I said, to Father Bob Niederding, who has taken the reins of the diocese during an interim period. And I'm sure he will provide, continue to provide me with a great introduction to this community of faith. What do I know about Lexington? 
I know I have to learn a lot about horses and UK basketball. I know a thing or two about bourbon. But actually, the little I know about this diocese comes from my participation in a Franciscan Peace and Justice Conference back in the 1990s when we gathered to learn about Appalachia. I remember an incredible trip from the Lexington Airport to places like Hazard and Harlan through fall foliage that I had not seen because I was living in California at the time. I learned a lot about the importance of the environment in that visit, surrounded by that great beauty. And I learned a lot about the history of the struggles of the people of Appalachia, and I was deeply impressed by the signs of enculturation I saw there, like quilts and rocking chairs in the churches. I learned that a holler didn't necessarily have anything to do with shouting. And I learned that the church can be vibrant and make an impact and transform lives, even when it only makes up a small percentage of the population. I'm inspired now to hear about the ever more visible presence of our Hispanic brothers and sisters in this diocese. As is the case throughout the entire nation, Latino Catholics are a growing presence. Much more than that, they're a life-giving presence in the American church. We tend to forget that the church in the United States has always been a church of immigrants. We can be proud of the many success stories of integrating populations from other lands into the American culture through a network of Catholic institutions throughout the course of our history. Our parishes, our schools, social service agencies, hospitals, and other institutions that grew up and served in a variety of ethnic communities were very successful at integrating immigrants into the mainstream of society and the church. And sometimes they were so successful at this that the next generations needed to hear what the children of Israel had to learn again and again. Remember that you were once strangers and aliens. Now the church has to rise to meet new demographics and new waves of immigrants who are already part of our Catholic universal church. And we must learn to celebrate the gifts that they bring. Pope Francis speaks frequently about the need to be open to an encounter, an encounter with the other, an encounter with the poor, an encounter with Christ through them. New immigrants provide a great opportunity for that encounter. In mi experiencia, los católicos hispanos muestran un entusiasmo para la fe que no se encuentra en otros lugares. Sus devociones, su religiosidad y la conexión que hacen fácilmente entre la fe y la vida diaria son ejemplares y pueden ser una fuerza de renovación para la iglesia entera en los Estados Unidos. Yo he aprendido mucho de la comunidad hispana y en verdad ellos me han formado como pastor y como ministro. Su alegría y su fe, a pesar de las luchas de su experiencia, me dan esperanza y quiero seguir acompañando a esta comunidad en el camino hacia el reino de Dios. What I said is I've learned a lot from the Hispanic community. They have formed me as a priest and a pastor, and their enthusiasm and vibrancy with which they live the faith has made a huge difference in my life. So I look forward to continuing to accompany them and celebrate their gifts in the life of this church. I understand that Catholics make up only 3% of the general population of the 50 counties that comprise this diocese. So the challenge for us as a local church then has its root in the gospel, to be salt, to be leaven, to be light in society. And salt, leaven, and light in society, or anywhere, are easily taken for granted when they have their desired effects. They're noticed in their absence. We will need to continue to ask ourselves, what difference our Catholic presence makes in this central and eastern part of the state? How do we bring good news to all people, not just the ones on our rosters and in our pews? Material poverty is clearly a significant issue for a great percentage of our population. What a great context for putting the gospel into practice. Jesus described his own messianic mission as one of bringing good news to the poor. We must do the same. Pope Francis has stated repeatedly that he wants a poor church for the poor. We certainly have the ingredients for that church right here. Pope Francis also calls for a missionary option in the church. Not a focus on self-preservation, but an outward-looking church ready to provide all people with an encounter and with the presence of the living Christ. I really look forward to seeing what's already going on in this diocese, the mission work that is being accomplished, and I'm honored to become part of its missionary presence. 
I see that there's a great representation of women religious here in this diocese. Thank God. So often it has been the sisters who are in the front lines of putting the gospel into action in the loving service that Jesus demonstrates for us. I look forward to getting to know their ministries here. And the presence of fellow men religious in the diocese is a source of comfort and encouragement for me as well. As grateful as I am to Pope Francis for this appointment and as enthusiastic as I am to live my vocation as pastor in this local church, I must admit that I will grieve the change in relationship to my Franciscan community, a community that has loved and supported and formed and encouraged me throughout my religious life and my priestly life. I grew up around Franciscans. I entered the Franciscan community shortly after high school and then grew up some more with their help. And there are no words to express my gratitude and appreciation for my friars in the province of Our Lady of Consolation. A Jesuit pope by the name of Francis sends you a Franciscan bishop trained by Jesuits. <laughs> I hope that's not too scary for the priests of the diocese. The priests of the diocese will be my closest collaborators. The permanent deacons are a great service of this church together with their wives. You know, talking about the diocesan clergy, I did get some up-close experience with diocesan clergy when I served as moderator of the Curia for the Diocese of El Paso, and I enjoyed a wonderful working relationship with them, just as I look forward to experiencing here. So. I hope I can quickly lay aside any apprehensions you might have. Um, it's encouraging to see the strong diaconate community together with their wives. I'm anxious to meet the laity of this church, the vast majority of the disciples who form this diocese and who live the faith in their family lives and in the workplace. I want to learn how they do that, how they live their faith today, and how the institutional church of this diocese can provide the support they need to do so. You probably want to know my priorities and my agenda. In the places where I've served, I've tried to focus on worship and service, two very broad and very interconnected aspects of the Christian life. We are to invite others to encounter with Christ in the sacraments, and the sacraments in turn are to nourish and strengthen and heal us to serve others and to build up God's kingdom, God's reign. The details will come after lots of listening, seeing, and experiencing what is already going on here. I spoke to Bishop Gaynor this morning, and from all that I've heard and read, he did great things to build up this local church and set a wonderful structure in place, so I have lots to build on here. I will definitely take inspiration and guidance from Pope Francis' apostolic exhortation, the joy of the gospel, and I'll try to follow the example that he set. I'm hoping, of course, that he will allow the substitution of the smell of horses for the smell of sheep that the shepherd must have. And maybe you have some questions for me. Do you know when yet you'll be uh, installed? Or is yes, we're planning the installation for the Tuesday, May 5th, after Derby Day. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, Father Nieberding, turn it back to you. <laughs> <laughs> there are no further questions, then we can conclude. Thank you. Uh, let me just conclude with a simple prayer that comes from St. Francis himself. Most high and glorious God, enlighten the darkness of my heart. Give me right faith, certain hope, sense, and knowledge, so that I may carry out your holy and true command. Amen. Amen. One of the things that really endears people to Pope Francis is the use of images in his speech and in his writing, and perhaps of all the images that he uses when he speaks about the church as a field hospital for sinners. That's just loaded with implications for us, especially in a season of conversion and repentance. Imagine a tent set up near the battleground where people come to be nursed back to health. And that's very different than seeing the church as a, as a place for the perfect. Similarly, when he talks about the Eucharist, he cautions pastors and all church personnel to realize that the Eucharist is not a prize for those who are perfect, but the Eucharist is meant to be nourishment for the weak 
and a, a medicine, powerful medicine for those who are struggling. That doesn't mean there are no standards or no requirements, but it means that the church is above all merciful. The call to conversion that we commemorate during the season of Lent is really, it's not just about individuals, it's about the church itself. Pope Francis invites us to consider conversion not as a sign of weakness at all, but a sign of a greater desire to grow up, draw closer to God, who invites us to that nearness, especially in this special season. Pope Paul VI was quoted by Pope Francis in inviting the church to consider her role as the spotless bride of Christ, and wherever we fall short of that mark, in individuals or in structures, to look for what needs to change. Pope Francis would add to that that in a very materialist society, we have run the danger of using people as disposable objects, much as we use material things. Those are challenging words for any of us in a society of abundance, but Pope Francis realizes that God is merciful and he calls us to experience that mercy. And he wants us to convey that mercy in a joyful way. What a great and profound meditation for us in this season of Lent. So we recently just celebrated the first anniversary of the election of Pope Francis. The phenomenon of his election, the Pope of Firsts in many senses, coming from Latin America, from the Jesuit order, has captivate, captivated the world's imagination and enlightened the Church and inspired the Church in new ways. More than just his visible gestures of inclusion, the way that he's reached out to the people on the periphery in his own words, Pope Francis has inspired us to go out beyond ourselves. In the Feast of Christ the King last year, he released what was called an apostolic exhortation, Evangelium Gau Evangelii Gaudium. Evangelii Gaudium really sets not only the, the goals of his papacy, but it sets the tone. It is filled, as the name implies, with joy. Pope Francis' smile has captured the imagination of hearts and minds all over the world, and Pope Francis has something much deeper beyond that smile to offer. He communicates the love of Christ, and he wants us to share the love of Christ. He laments the fact that too often Christianity is portrayed without joy. He says sometimes we look like Christians who are stuck in Lent without any hope of Easter. The Pope has asked us to move beyond those kinds of approaches to our faith and to really share the dynamism of Christ who is crucified and risen for us. He also talks about a culture that has multiplied occasions for pleasure, but experiences pleasure as a fleeting thing without ever getting into joy. He wants us all to encounter Christ and to share that encounter with others and really build on a lasting and durable joy that comes from the gospel. Pope Francis has endeared himself to many, but his words are very challenging. His apostolic exhortation invites us to take a closer look at ourselves and how we're living that faith. What witness do we give to others? He calls bishops and clergy and religious and laity, everyone, to take a look at how we live our faith and whether it's something that is attractive to others. He's also about taking risks. And Pope Francis says, I prefer a church that is bruised, hurting, and dirty because it's been out on the streets than a church unhealthy for being confined and clinging to its own security. Let's hear what Pope Francis has to say and try to reach beyond our comfort zone and put the gospel into practice wherever we are. Pope Francis's apostolic exhortation Evangelii Gaudium, is filled with the desire to see a church that is more missionary once again. It was Pope Paul VI who said that the church exists to evangelize, and Pope Francis really employs that broad understanding of all of the church's activity has to be missionary in nature. He asks all of us to take a look at what we are doing, how much of our pastoral work is about administration, how much of it is about maintenance, and how much is really about reaching out to those who most desperately need to hear the word of God. When we think about the joy that characterizes that whole apostolic exhortation, we see it in his person. We see with the way he interacts with the crowds and especially with the vulnerable. 
But he calls the church to renew its reaching out to the margins, going out beyond itself. He invites all of us to get out of our comfort zones and really be about bringing Jesus Christ to the places where he's needed the most. There are ways in which each of us each of us can do that. Pope Francis has given us a great example. His smile and his manner says so much. Are we that kind of Christian? Is that how we invite people to our communities of faith? What can we do to spread the joy of the gospel?